But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. On his 22nd birthday, Charles Barkley dunked with such force and fury that he moved everything, the stanchion, the backboard, the basket. There was a 23-minute delay while workers restored and realigned what Sir Charles wrought with his earthquake. And it seemed to sum him up. Everything he did or said tended to the extravagant and outrageous. He dared you to ignore him. That was rarely possible. I can't think of too many more things more fun than covering the dream team and particularly Charles Barkley in Barcelona. He was the king of Las Ramblas. That was the big uh, party street in Barcelona. Charles was the life of Barcelona. Only Charles could have 5,000 people following him all over the place. He would go out and talk to people who were pretty unfortunate. And I remember one homeless woman who never asked him for anything. He just one day stuck a wad of bills in a bag. The best of times was Charles rolling down the Ramblas. The worst of times was when he would elbow an Angolan. I don't know anything about Angola, but Angola's in trouble. Barkley, a little contact, just a little elbow to send the message here. The little guys from Angola, they were out of control. They were throwing elbows as well. So Charles being a competitor, he's going to throw an elbow back. I asked him whether that was in keeping with the Olympic ideal, and he said, hey, it's the ideal of the playground. This is the way you play. I said to Michael, I said, Michael, why don't you have a talk with Charles? You know, get him calmed down a little bit. He said, We've tried, it's your turn. It was kind of hilarious political satire. I mean, what could be funnier than him, you know, elbowing this guy and then when called for it, well, who knows, you could have had a spear or something. You have the idea one way or another he might cause an international incident. If Charles Barkley's colorful behavior kept opponents and State Departments on edge, he helped motivate the greatest collection of basketball talent ever assembled as the U.S. Olympic team coasted to gold. I thought of all of the players, he left the rocker room with the most fire. He was really, really determined not to be embarrassed and not to lose that gold medal. He was definitely our MVP during that Olympic run. And still today, you sit there and watch him and say, how did a man his size be able to do the things that he did? I'll throw it down your throat like Barkley. Here he come, no doubt, clear the lane now. Isolation play, plus he got things to say. Banging wide to the board, oh Lord. The glass belongs to the top of the class, come on. Along the baseline, Barkley, two more. He's got 56 points. I mean, people talk about who they'll never be another. I think it'll be a long time before there's a 6'4 guy who can do what Charles Barkley did. Inch for inch, the greatest rebounder ever in the NBA. Smallest man ever to win the rebounding championship. His ability to dominate games physically at that height is something that I don't think anybody has really done before or since. Desire. He did it with desire and a big old butt. He was just telling me, you know, you shoot the basketball and I'm going to get every rebound. And, and I tell you, he would get every rebound. His pure desire and his love for the game, um, you know, he became an overachiever. Boards were only part of Barkley's game. One of only four players with 20,000 points, 12,000 rebounds, and 4,000 assists, he performed not only to win, but to excite. I think that part of Charles Barkley's contribution is that he understood what he was doing was entertainment. That you came and you wanted a show. I saw him kiss a guy when he made a game-winning shot. I saw him shoot free throws with his eyes closed. I saw him knock out mascots by the dozens. The biggest thing that Charles wanted was attention. 
and he got it as a basketball player, but that wasn't good enough. Charles Barkley was a fat kid who grew into a great basketball player, and I think he's very grateful for any attention that he gets. Charles liked to be surrounded by people and liked to have them reacting to what he was saying and doing. It was such a mix of uh, good and bad and logic and illogic. It was a walking mass of contradictions. His thing is that you can never understand who he is. So trying to rationalize the things that he does, you'll never be able to do that. My idol a lot of times is Charles Barkley. I wish I could say what he says. I would personally like to tell all y'all out there who bash it to kiss my big black ass. You know, have you ever noticed that Charles Barkley gets in trouble because he tells the truth? He's a bad official. He's been bad the whole time I've been in the league. I hate he came back. I have heard him say things that I would kill anybody else if they said it. I would kill him in writing. I'd kill him on TV. But because it was Charles, you kind of just like, you laugh. And you don't want to laugh, but it's funny. That was a really, really boring game. I apologize for playing like crap, but I couldn't get motivated. I ain't gonna lie. The guy used to read the newspaper on his way to every game just so he could have analogies to use off the front page. The sexual harassment stuff is really getting to the point where it's absurd. Oh, Paula Jones would be lucky somebody want to touch her ugly ass. Charles just came out and spoke what was on top of his mind and gave you almost that Muhammad Ali feel. Dan Marley? Oh my, Dan, Dan, I'm just like every other woman in Phoenix. Can I have you? That same Southern smoothness that kind of makes it good for the air. It's kind of like the difference between Ali and Tyson. Ali could say the same thing Mike Tyson said, but I'll eat your children, and he'd have everybody laughing. You know, Tyson says it, and it's like they want to put him in an insane asylum. You know, some people can't tell a joke. Barkley can tell a joke. Oh, that ESPN News? Y'all still trying to rip people off with that old station, aren't you? I don't think I've ever said anything that nobody else has said, but if you're a regular person, you're giving your opinion. If you're famous, you're an opinionated or you're controversial. He inspired more discussion over the importance or the lack of importance of role models in athletics than any single individual I can remember. I am not a role model. Charles had said it. All I did was, you know, tighten up the language a little more and take a couple four-letter words out. Parents should be role models. What he was saying was take responsibility for your own children. You know, I'm not your daddy. Just because I dunk a basketball doesn't mean I should raise your kids. Barkley said what everybody ought to be saying. Don't wait for a professional athlete to mentor your child because he or she is a celebrity. He got this before anybody else. You're not something because you wish you weren't. He was very much a role model whether he cared to admit it or not. There are so many single parent uh, families uh, looking for help in raising their kids. And if he was gonna duck that responsibility, that, that did make me angry. In retrospect, if the league had, had control over it, the league would, ne you know, would never have let anything like that happen. I think that the reaction to I am not a role model suddenly cast him as the heel, the villain in the world wrestling basketball sweepstakes. I feel sure over the years that he didn't get the commercial spot because of his personality. So, but it works both ways. I'm sure he's gotten some because of his being outspoken. Anything less would be uncivilized. There's a lot of athletes that hire people to go out and work for them to make you think they're a nice guy. Charles is really a nice guy, but he'd rather think that he's a jerk. That was part of his charm, but that was also part of his curse. Before the 1995 All-Star Game in Phoenix, Barkley's playful impulse to shock burned the media wires. I'd been working on a sport magazine story uh, on, on Charles for about two, three weeks. This big German guy sticks his microphone in and he says, we're doing a story on NBA groupies. Uh, the, the grouping thing is a sick subject and you guys should get a f***ing life. Thank you. And Charles just looks down at me and he goes, that's why I hate white guys. And when the thing was over, I said to him, you don't hate white guys. And he goes, 
Now I'm just effing with it. Sun's response to the last comment about white people was to say ESPN is a news organization trying to make news out of a non-story. Charles Barkley, through a spokesman, called it a non-story. The NBA had no comment. It was just a momentary lapse of uh, uh, stupidity for a moment. Charles being Charles, trying to be funny, and it wasn't funny. He got a lot of hate mail. It was really bad. It was really brutal. I think this certain segment of the population could not accept him. What they didn't realize was this pretty good heart that Charles had. He would frequently call our PR guy and say, I'd like to go to Children's Hospital. But if I see a camera crew or anybody from the newspapers, I'm not going in. The Celtics were playing the Sixers, and Barkley dove out of bounds for this loose ball and, and missed me by inches. And uh, I was very pregnant at the time. And then afterwards, as I was walking out, he pulled me aside and he said, uh, can I be serious for a minute? You really shouldn't sit there. I'd hate for anything to happen to you or your baby. Charles Barkley did some things which even those of us who really like him couldn't possibly justify or rationalize. But he gets a relative pass on a lot of that because generally he's so pleasant and outgoing. He's spitting at people, throwing people through plate gas windows. I used to smile at it, but, but like most other people, I, I would say, why would Charles do that to himself? Charles Wade Barkley was born in Leeds, Alabama, to Frank and Charcy in February of 1963. I really don't like to talk uh, much about Charles' father. We separated uh, when Charles was not even a year old. I know one time he hit her, and I told him that I'd take his wife and baby home with me, and I did. I really struggled with not having a father there. Two women and three boys, it was always a constant struggle. Charles's grandmother, I've always referred to as chairman of the board. She's the one who held everything together. My mother was a strict disciplinarian. She could whoop harder than any man could ever whoop. Charles was about 14 or 15, and he said to me, Granny, you and Mama ain't gonna never have to work no more because I'm gonna play the fish in the basketball. I heard him say he's going to play with Dr. J. And everybody laughed at him and called him names. There's not really much use for a 5'10 fat point guard. I started doing these drills to get my legs stronger, jumping over this fence, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. At night when all other kids might be out on a date, a Charles would be on the basketball court, and the people in the projects would tease me. Every night, by the time we start to go to sleep, we hear that boom, 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 boom out there on the basketball court. I wasn't the most highly recruited player on my team. So I realized the only way I was going to get the ball was get rebounds. So going to my senior year, I wanted to get 20 rebounds a night. That was my goal. Averaging 18 rebounds and 19 points as a six foot four inch high school senior, Barkley was recruited nationwide. He chose nearby Auburn, where he grew out instead of up. We weighed him in October 15th at 232 pounds. By the end of his freshman year, he was at 278. You couldn't get it off of him. You could break the plate. You could uh, monitor his eating habits. I even sent coaches with him to class and to the dining hall. They go and they play a, a ball game. They give him a post-game sandwich, a snack. Charles somehow smuggles three giant pizzas into his room. Well, when I first saw Charles, I looked at this, I said, this, this big guy, this big guy can't play. And he dunked him. And I looked at this guy like, how can this big guy put all his weight in the air? He's kind of like the bumblebee, I would say. The bumblebee aeronautically ain't supposed to fly. He got this little round, but little bitty wings. This guy ain't supposed to jump. Averaging 14 points and 10 rebounds in his first two seasons at Auburn, the outsized Barkley drew more jeers than cheers. I'm Charles Barkley, Auburn Tigers. Here I feel my nickname, the bread truck, the love boat, food world, the Crystal kid, which is my second favorite, the wide loads and lead, the town of fun, the good time blimp. But my favorite is the round mound of rebound. Went to different places to play the holler fat boy, fat boy. 
Um, he was a big kid. Some of the Tennessee people had got Domino's Pizza to, to deliver two pizzas to Charles on the court before the game. But the scorn of road crowds paled in comparison to the problems between Barkley and head coach Sonny Smith. Sonny pushed Charles in places that, that he had never been and didn't want to be pushed in. Sonny told him Charles, you could ever play and practice should be a great play. He told Sonny, well, coach, you know, when the bright lights come on, I play. That's all that counts. He wanted to practice, but not practice hard. Instead of rotating across and taking a charge, Charles would rotate across and just knock the guy up in the stands. So I ran at him, I swung at him, and I hit him in the chest right here. He just backed off and said, Coach, don't hit me anymore. Let him smile it. He's really a good kid. He's just got to work a little bit more at his work habits, have a little bit more desire in practice. So let me tell you something, son. You got a world of ability, but I watch you in practice today, and you're just going through motions. Listen to your coach. Your coach loves you. Your people here love you. Listen to them. They're trying to help you, man. I think once Sonny realized that he had somebody who was a little bit different, I think they, they came closer together, and I think it made Auburn a better team. As a junior, the Rotund forward helped lead Auburn to its first NCAA tournament appearance, scoring 15 points and grabbing nine rebounds a game. After the Tigers lost in the first round, Barkley was invited to try out for Bobby Knight's 1984 Olympic team. He was the best player on the floor you know, better than Michael Jordan and Patrick Ewing and, and everybody who was on that team. I remember Coach Knight asking him to come back to minicamp within five pounds of his best playing weight. And Charles came back and hadn't even touched the basketball. Come time for the first cut, Bobby Knight got up there and he started talking. The first name he called out was Charles Barkley. We were like, oh man, if he's cut, then well, I'm cut. If Knight didn't appreciate the cut of Barkley's jib, the NBA certainly did. In the 1984 draft, Philadelphia selected him number five, behind Akeem Olajuwon, Sam Bowie, Michael Jordan, and Sam Perkins. The Philadelphia 76ers select Charles Barkley of Auburn University. I said, I want to play for 10 years and get 10 rebounds a night and make a million dollars. And th those were my three goals, because I wanted to just take care of my family coming out of, out of high school. And I, I achieved all those goals. Tipping the 76ers training scales at 272 pounds, Charles Barkley was not a perfect fit for a team that had won the 1983 NBA title. Initially, I wasn't that excited. You're talking about someone under 6'5" playing a power forward position in the NBA, uh, there wasn't anyone like that. Well, here comes this brash rookie onto a team that already has Moses Malone, that has the elegant Julia serving, that has all these established stars and veterans. One would look at the other and say, can you believe this kid? A guy who liked to have fun, a guy who had enormous skills. And some of the parts of the game were, were a little too easy for him. But under the guidance of center Moses Malone, Barkley began to make his mark, not only on the league, but on some of its players. Charles's idea of a fast break was to get the ball himself, get up such a head of steam, find a way to finish that off with a dunk. And I think the idea of a big man having this kind of 94-foot game without a guard, without an outlet pass, uh, is pretty unprecedented. So Charles he had the ability to grab the rebound, handle the ball, and break the press by himself and go down and get a layup. And then there's this string of bodies laying in his wake. I had made in my mind, a guard might draw one charge on me, but he's only going to draw one. If a guard had the guts to stand in front of me one time, I was going to try to kill him so he would only do it once. In his second season, Barkley averaged 20 points and 13 rebounds, but Philadelphia was eliminated in the semifinals of the Eastern Conference playoffs. Then, on draft day, Barkley lost his mentor when Malone was moved to the Bullets. In two deals, the 76ers obtained Jeff Ruland, Cliff Robinson, and Roy Henson. The darkest day in the history of the franchise. Jeff Ruland lasted five games before his knee gave way. Those trades were actually made for Charles. Uh, it was our intent at that time to try to build a team around Charles. It completely freed Charles up. 
Charles became absolutely a huge major star because he had freedom. This has become kind of Charles Barkley's team. This has become, if not the greatest show on earth, at least the noisiest show on earth. Barkley for three! Oh, no! Barkley remained irrepressible over the next four seasons. In 1990, he averaged 25 points and 12 boards and finished second to Magic Johnson in the MVP voting. On the next to last game of the season, he took the Sixers to their first division title in seven seasons in a brawl-filled matchup with the defending NBA champion Pistons. Charles was like, I'm so sick of Bill Lamb, dear. So he wrote a note, dear Lamb, f you. <laughs> Love, Charles and Rick. We knew throughout the whole course of the game that we were going to get into some kind of an altercation between Mahorn and myself and Barkley. Oh, Barkley just nailed Lambeer on the chin with a lefty. And now fires another one. Barkley and Lambeer slammed by... Oh, this is ugly. And Charles was so mad he'd gotten ejected from the game that he'd ripped the urinal off the wall. And I'm just looking at this hole in the wall, this water shooting out. It looked like a fire hose was behind it. Of the $155,000 in fines levied by the NBA, $20,000 was billed to Barkley. The fallout from the altercation proved to be the beginning of the end of Barkley's tumultuous stay in Philadelphia. In March of 1991 against the New Jersey Nets, Charles Barkley was the target of another's brashness. There's this one guy behind the baseline who was getting on Charles through the whole game, and it got progressively worse. And Barkley it just apparently had, had enough I kind of watched him gather his spit together and just let it fly in the direction of the heckler, standing right really behind my daughter. The next thing I remember is Charles just spitting, and I got wet. I was like, oh my God, what just happened? He said, man, it's the worst thing I've ever done. I went too far this time. And I never heard him say that any other time, before or after. Two days later, I got a phone call from Charles Barkley. He said that he was basically sorry and would like to speak to my daughter. Even if I had to spit on that guy, he didn't deserve it. No matter how ignorant he was, I got to be bigger than that. Lauren taught me a great deal. And I think the best thing ever happened was the way she treated me. Barkley was fined $10,000 and suspended for one game. Chastened but unbowed, he redirected his anger at teammates and management. When he wanted to tell you something, he would tell you. And uh, either you were mentally tough enough to take it or you would just wilt under, you know, his pressure. If you missed five or six jump shots in a row, he would tell you that your jump shot had gone on vacation. And he might then label you with the name vacation. Harold Katz is the one that everybody blames, who was the owner at that time, brought in players that just couldn't play and couldn't win. Uh, Charles' favorite joke is, you know, I asked for Shaq and they brought in Charles Shackelford. After losing to the Bulls in the 1990 and 91 playoffs, Barkley's eighth season in Philadelphia was his roughest. Rick Mahorn was gone, and the media was closing in. He was doing anything he could to get himself traded, and he was also extremely frustrated. But it started with, in training camp, saying the Sixers would keep Dave Hoppin on the roster because they wouldn't have 12 black guys. I said, some people might be offended by an all-black team. And when I woke up the next day, it's like, Barkley said they only keep a guy because he's white. There's always been some form of racism. Well, people never discuss it. It's 1991. If nobody ever discussed it, it's never going to get solved. I thought they were racist to me in Philadelphia. The press was it. I would listen to other athletes in Philadelphia. They would say, we are really not good enough. We need to get better. But when I was said, the hit like Barkley bashed his teammates. He had finally decided that he was going to stop worrying what people thought of his comments, his responses to questions were. Stop thinking about it and say what you feel, say what you believe, and if you have to defend it, then defend it. He filmed a commercial, day of a game. Questioning gets around to Charles, maybe filming a commercial a day of a game is not a good idea. Charles announces in a booming voice, I'm a 90s nigger, which means I can do whatever I want to, whenever I want to. People say Charles Barkley is a racist. How can he be a racist? He's married to a white woman. Marrying Maureen Blumhardt in 1989 and fathering daughter Christiana that same year, the couple was not appreciated in every precinct of the city of brotherly love. 
the society here, for whatever reason, some small segment of that society wasn't ready for an interracial marriage that involved one of their heroes. Some people said some things that were cruel, and I know that bothered them, and, and they never said it when he was around. He didn't outwardly show signs of being affected dramatically by that. Did it bother him inside? I would bet you that it did. In his autobiography, Outrageous, Barclay left little unsaid. But when it exploded in bookstores in late 1991, the author tried to look the other way. Phones lit up, and one of the callers was Charles Barclay. And Barclay said, Bill, I was misquoted in that book. You claim to have been misquoted in your autobiography. Dave, I... I, 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 I... <laughs> At the time, I thought, this could be litigation history. A man sues himself for libel. That December, Barclay made headlines again after getting involved in a skirmish outside a Milwaukee bar. Although acquitted six months later by a jury, the damage was done. The 76ers sent him packing. They said not guilty. And I ran out the courtroom and I got a phone call from my agent. He's been traded. I said, where am I going? He's going to Phoenix. And I was racing to the airport to catch a plane. And I remember, I said, I don't care how much it costs, free drinks for everybody on the plane. I think he, he realized that he wasn't going to get a championship ring had he stayed in Philadelphia. And I think he desperately wanted an opportunity to play for a championship. So I think the team really did him a favor in accommodating him and making a trade with Phoenix. I felt like the Sixers just wanted to put me out there, make it to the playoffs, and lose. And I couldn't take that, because I knew there were bigger things for me. Charles Barkley was the biggest figure of any kind, sports or otherwise, ever to hit Arizona. It was really Charles Barkley comes to Hooterville. I took him upstairs in the balcony of America West Arena, and I pointed to the ceiling. I says, that's what you can do for the Phoenix Suns. You can bring them a championship. Coming off a gold medal with the Dream Team in Barcelona and burdened with the expectations of nothing less than a championship ring, Charles Barkley played at the top of his game during his first season with Phoenix. It was a great timing for Phoenix that Charles had played in the Olympics before. Charles was in fantastic shape when he showed up in training camp that year. And it just carried over throughout the entire season. What Charles did was give us a confidence that we didn't have before. And more times than not, he carried us through. Averaging 26 points and 12 boards, Barkley won his only MVP by carrying the Suns into the 1993 NBA Finals. Waiting for him were the champion Chicago Bulls and his close friend. I can't express the depth of me and Michael's relationship as far as him being my brother. He's always been there for me, always behind closed doors. Sometimes I dream that he is me. I just want to be like Chuck, I mean Mike. Michael was always good at flashing his rings and letting Charles know that he didn't have any and he wasn't going to get any. Maybe only a friend could do that. I think it's important for Barkley to be around Jordan because he feels it elevates and cultivates him in some way. Jordan watched him on TV one day and called him up and said, you got to start dressing right. You're a black businessman in America here. Put on a suit. Michael doesn't need to cultivate friendships. And I think it was part of this irrepressible uh, Barkley nature. Charles was able to say things that Michael might have felt like saying, but they were coming out of the mouth of Charles. I remember Jordan saying, I wish I could say some of the things that Charles Barkley says. Is America going to love you as much as Jordan by the end of this? Love me? Oh, I'm their worst nightmare. A brother who won't be quiet. The Bulls and Jordan provided Barkley and the Suns with a nightmare of their own, winning the first two games in Phoenix. But Sir Charles answered in game three in Chicago. This was the moment when, wait a minute, uh, I, I can be on a par with, uh, with Michael Jordan. I can be the best basketball player in the world. I'm going to play this one to the hill. And King able to get to Barkley on the other side. 
Barkley would not let his team lose. You know, every overtime, every timeout, he was like, come on, come on. He was patting the guys on the back, and he was just willing them to victory. Barkley's 24-point, 19-rebound performance in Game 3 brought the Suns back into the series. After the Bulls responded by winning the fourth game, Barkley scored another 24 points as the Suns took Game 5. The Bulls have to schlep back to Phoenix. They're in a foul mood, and the Suns have the lead late. The Bulls have made up their mind that they were not going to let me score. And we got a turnover, a missed jumper, and another turnover. With Phoenix leading 98-96 with 14 seconds remaining, Barkley made a questionable decision. The Suns Charles went for the steal, and Pippen started to drive. I could see Horace Grant open on the baseline. And before I could even turn around, he just hot potato right back out to Paxson, and I just went, please miss. Please miss. Yes! The Bulls take a one-point lead, and Phoenix falls for time! Had Charles played more conservatively, maybe they would have won. Although Charles outwardly might not have expressed to everyone his emotions about losing that series, inwardly there was no one that hated more to lose to Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls than Charles Barkley. You want to say it was a great year, but you, you, you feel so bad right now. I know he must have thought, you know, if I didn't beat that guy this season, uh, I don't think I'm ever going to. After losing to the Bulls in the 1993 Finals, Charles Barkley, at 30, looked towards an uncertain future. Charles was so motivated that that was going to be the year. His body was breaking down a little bit. He didn't quite take care of himself in the offseason, you know, the way he should. Because he was so good and so gifted, Charles really didn't believe that he had to keep his body in shape and work at it. Charles was playing golf, eating pie and ice cream, and having a good old time in the offseason. But when the fourth quarter came, Charles wanted to win as bad as anybody else. With elbow, back, and knee injuries, Barkley considered retirement in each of his last three seasons with the Suns. I'll tell you the same thing I told the team after the game. More than likely, I have played my last game. There was a couple times that he announced his retirement, but uh, we all just kind of waited to see and hoped that he'd come back for the next year. I convinced him that he was given a, a gift and we needed him very badly. Barkley stayed, but after blowing 2-0 playoff leads to the Rockets in 1994 and 95, the sunny atmosphere in Phoenix darkened. Much of the drama fell on Barkley and Kevin Johnson. Charles and I got along as players. We had different interests. I don't know if we both tried as hard to make the relationship work. You know, there's a story of Charles saying, KJ, come to the strip club with me and I'll go to church with you on Sunday. And, you know, KJ lived fulfilled his end of the bargain, and Charles said, no, I'm not going to church. In August of 1996, 16 days after Barkley won his second Olympic gold medal, he was traded to Houston. If he was still effective on the court, his relationship with the public was increasingly tenuous. When a woman in Scottsdale tore up his autograph, he poured beer over her head. Three other incidents in which punches were allegedly thrown resulted in no punishment for Barkley. You can't talk to Charles and tell him, all right, Charles, don't put yourself in a position to where you could get in trouble. You gotta be kidding. Charles Barkley's Charles Barkley. That's part of his persona. I opened my uh, Marley Sports Grill in 93, and uh, I remember he used to come in after games, and we'd have to put monsters around his table because there'd just be crowds of people, you know, eight, 10 deep, just standing there looking at him. He was a very accessible guy. Allowing that access, you also get some people whose objective is not friendly. I've seen other athletes in these type of situations. They just say, oh, you know what? We better get the hell out of here. This is a no-win situation. Charles wasn't able to see that. He couldn't walk away because it's not in Charles's nature to walk away. He interpreted that as a sign of weakness or vulnerability. That's what made him appeal to the working people. He wasn't a saint. He was just Charles. And if you rubbed him the wrong way, he had the right to get mad. 
In October of 1997, in Orlando, a party came to a crashing end. The little guy uh, said something to Charles. Charles followed him outside. All he said was, hey, you're going to give me some respect. And he pushed the little guy against the wall and just happened to have some mirror there. When Charles pushed him, the little glass fell on the floor, and, and of course the little guy acted like he was dead at that point. This is a victim, 20-year-old Jorge Lugo, moments after being released from the hospital. He's banged up after he was tossed through a plate glass window at Phineas Fogg's. Eyewitnesses say it was Houston Rockets player Charles Barkley who did it. Let there be no conflict in America. If you bother me, I'm going to whoop your ass. I threw him through the window. So they asked me that I have any regrets. I said, yeah, I regret that we were on the first floor. That's about it. I wish we were on, like, the third floor, so he could have failed. Barkley settled with Lugo for a reported $75,000 and paid a $320 fine to an Orlando court. Although he received no suspension from the NBA, the league threatened to cut short Barkley's career unless he secured a bodyguard. He doesn't have a posse. He doesn't have a bunch of people. He, he would come to things by himself. And finally, the league said, you can't do this anymore. You know, they made it very simple. I'm either going to retire or get security. And uh, that's Thanks pretty simple. So I meet 50 people a day. So I probably met, you know, a million people. And a million have been great. Five or six have been really bad. I wouldn't trade that for the world. I don't mind those little six or seven negative things because I meet the most incredible people. I think Charles, it, it's one of his greatest traits and it's one of his worst is that he just wants to be a normal person. And unfortunately for him, he can't be a normal person. Back on the court, Barkley's drive for that elusive championship ring was fading, despite Akeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler at his side. Then, in January of 1999, Scotty Pippen replaced the retiring Drexler. We had this thing called the Breakfast Club, him dream, and Scotty would work out, they would lift every morning and, and, and get their bodies right. I see that Charles and uh, Scotty have a very good relationship, the way they talk and joke around. But when Pippen demanded to be traded after the season, Barkley fumed. Having deferred part of his salary so the Rockets could obtain Pippen, he demanded an apology. I gave up more than anybody to get Scotty. And for him to want to leave after one year just disappointed me greatly. That's his opinion. He's a very uh, selfish guy. Uh, he doesn't show me the desire to want to win. I probably should have listened to Michael when he said that Charles never will win a championship because he doesn't show any dedication. If anything, he owed me an apology for coming to play with his sorry fat butt. Michael called me from Monte Carlo. Hey, man, you know I would never say anything bad about you. Whatever Scott has said is BS, BS, let that go, and don't worry about it. Three days after bashing Barkley, Pippen became a Portland trailblazer. But in the wake of Pippen's exit, there remained the question, why hadn't Barkley won a title? I think he wants to be seen in the echelon of the Jordans and the Birds and the Magic Johnsons, but in my mind, he was one step short of that single-minded drive. Winning to Michael was like Vince Lombardi. It was everything. And maybe it wasn't everything to Charles. That didn't mean he didn't want to win, but he might not prepare himself. There's no question that his, his lifestyle, I think, had some detriment on his level of play. Could he have kept himself in better shape and, and, and gotten to bed before closing time once in a while? Yeah, he could have, but that's the way he attacked life. There's so many things going into winning the championship. Charles Bark was not the reason why teams did not win championships. He's always said, you know, that's not going to define me if I never won a championship, but I think it really bothered him, and I think it, I think it bothered him really throughout his career. I don't know if it will ever haunt him. I think he's such a good-natured human being that he's going to let it go, but I think deep, deep, deep down in his heart that if he ever won a championship, he would have felt totally complete as a player. Charles Barkley announced in the fall of 1999 that the upcoming NBA season would be his last. But if he had any reservations, they would be shattered early in the year in Philadelphia. Maybe eight minutes into the game, uh, Tyrone Hill drove the baseline, and Charles was playing defense, and he went up to uh, block the shot. When he landed, it was a sharp crack of sound. Well, he's grabbing that knee immediately. You didn't hear a shriek of pain but you saw the end of a career. You knew without question that it was over. He cried when he went back to the locker room. 
I said, well, how did you hold back with all that pain? He said, my daughter was watching in Phoenix, and I didn't want her to see me in pain. Sad, you know, to see him cry like a little baby. I mean, he was just crying. And I told him, God, don't make no mistake, baby. It happened for a reason. It was supposed to happen like this. It was supposed to end in Philadelphia. I, I really believe that in my heart. But it wasn't quite the end for Barkley. With 37 recovered from his torn left quadricep enough to enter the Rockets' final game of the season. You can tell that he wanted to get back on the basketball court. You can tell that he wanted to, you know, get one more rebound. You can tell he wanted to, you know, score one more bucket. Ruggie Norris going to the basket, lays it up, misses. Oh, oh, oh. With a rebound, Charles with a cover, and he's close. Charles Barkley retires from the NBA. Barkley moved on to television, and the weight of his words and his body became topics for discussion. He's like, well, you can weigh me on the air or whatever. I don't care. You can't say that on television. Now, this is, now stand still, Chuck. Your weight tonight, 337. I didn't realize how fat I had got. I, I was fat. Now I'm chubby. I'm trying to get the big bone, then back to my plan weight. Meanwhile, Barkley keeps alive a rumor that he will one day pursue another job, governor of Alabama. Charles Barkley says, I still want to be governor, but not until I'm 45. He wants to help kids, and he believes if he can get on TV, if he can offer the message that here I am, a kid from a single parent household, mom was on welfare in Leeds, Alabama, and look what I did. I've been on both ends of the spectrum. I've been rich, I've been poor, and I, I think we need to get more uh, politicians in there who are not concerned about helping any group, just helping everybody. I love when he told his grandmother that he had become a Republican. And she said, Charles, um, you know, how can you be a Republican? The Republicans are for the rich people. And he said, you know, Grandma, I'm rich. Charles Barkley, it is officially time to bring you home. God has obviously blessed me beyond my wildest expectations. And I don't think he said, I'm going to give you all this power and money and fame and everything. And when you retire, I want you to sit at home and just have a big house, some cars, and have a lot of money. I never grew up expecting to be Charles Parker. I've never had a job. I think, knock on wood, I got more money than I could ever spend in my entire life. I met presidents, I met kings, and it's only because of basketball. That's it. It's only because of basketball. Anyone can score if they shoot often enough, Charles Barkley liked to say, but rebounding is the true measure of a man and his work ethic. In the spring of 2001, Sir Charles talked of rebounding himself. Finding nothing that fulfilled him like basketball, he talked about returning to the NBA and renewing his quest for a ring. As is usual with him, no one knew what to expect. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.